All right. Um, hi. Thanks for coming. Um, I noticed that people often do PowerPoints when they give presentations here. And I thought, oh, whatever. I, I won't do it. <laughs> I never do PowerPoints. But then I was thinking about, um, and I was just in Berlin for a couple of weeks, and I saw a couple of exhibitions. And particularly, I saw an exhibition of Gerhard Richter. And I thought, oh, I want to include this piece by Gerhard Richter. And so <laughs> a whole PowerPoint has been born. <laughs> um, so anyway, I will be. And uh, yeah. Phenomenological analysis has consistently shown the two sidedness of freedom. While our lives do not and cannot have a given form specified in advance, they nonetheless always give themselves a specific form through ongoing practices that, by intention or accident, commit us to a certain way of living. This specificity means that our lives are always also a matter of engagement with an outside, with the specific realities and the unspecified possibilities that contrast with the specificity by which we have defined ourselves. Our lives, therefore, are simultaneously a matter of living with a specific reality, a home, and having to respond to an outside to which we are exposed. While this structure obtains at both a personal and a social level, it is the social that concerns me here. My claim is that phenomenological analysis of the phenomenon of social life provides resources that are especially relevant for feminist philosophy and its attempt to grapple with the possibility of universal principles of justice across different cultural contexts. In conversation with Serene Cowder's feminist efforts to establish a set of core values for transnational feminist praxis that are not imperialist and yet universal in their opposition to sexist oppression, I will use John Russon's digestion of the basic political insights of phenomenology and Saba Mahmoud's critique of the parochial character of so-called Western conceptions of freedom to develop this philosophical framework. So these are the texts with which I am engaging. Also, I forgot to mention that I printed out a couple of copies. Should anyone uh, need to or want to read along? In Decolonizing Universalism, Serene Cotter challenges what she calls missionary feminism for importing its own specific ideas about what gender liberation requires into foreign scenes with quote unquote other women. Missionary feminism, Cotter argues, assumes a justice monism view that only one cultural form could accomplish gender justice or Western form. Cotter's goal is to offer an approach that is universalist insofar as it opposes sexist oppression but does not at the same time efface in a colonialist spirit the plurality of human situations, social and familial relations, and gender-related practices found across the globe. Cotter rightly claims that her framework offers normative philosophical grounding while being empirically and richly responsive to the determinate conditions of the lives of determinate women. I believe, however, that the normative grounding, the philosophical dimension, should be more robust. I will argue that it is the phenomenological framework largely suppressed by analytic philosophy and ignored by much of mainstream philosophical feminism, that can supply the relevant resources for addressing this issue. Though I make the argument in the spirit of furthering Cotter's crucial work, not fundamentally to challenge it. My argument is that we can find essential normative grounding for both the universality of justice and the inherent value of the specificity of human practices in phenomenological description of the emergence, development, and character of human experience as such. I will rely on Russen's work for the general phenomenological framework, which I will supplement with the work of Mahmoud for her account of the primordial, primordiality of interpersonal life to human experience and the critique of freedom that is paired with it. We will find here two core values for transnational feminist praxis. The first grounded in this primordiality of interpersonal life, which brings with it a conception of freedom that is a live phenomenological alternative to what Kader calls enlightenment freedom, and the second grounded in the relation between home and beyond, introduced implicitly by this interpersonal life. First section, Russen and Mahmoud on world and tradition. And again, I've just put a little uh, shorthand for the basic arguments in the, in the slides. Um, so don't get too distracted. Mm -hmm. I'm saying the real thing. <laughs> <laughs> Phenomenology observes that experience is always underway when we come to philosophical argumentation. Reality is manifested to an experiencer, namely to someone whose experience is already unfolding, who is already inside the manifested reality. This casts doubt on whether we are grasping things correctly philosophically, or whether it is simply that our experience is speaking of itself, 
through us in a way that we disavow. Provoked by this uncertainty, phenomenology claims that philosophical argumentation must begin with experience and describe its structure and its character in order to have greater philosophical purchase. The first so-called discovery that phenomenology makes in this foray into experience is captured by Heidegger's being in the world, a term that expresses the originality of a human being's relationship with the world. Our original experiential reality is, for instance, a matter of mouth-sucking nipple, hand-grasping finger, body-embracing body, foot-meeting grass, where there is not yet a discrete subject, a self-defined individual alienated from its surroundings, but a being developing an interaction with the world that is given to it via human bodily mediation, where those elements we misleadingly call subjective and objective are muddled with each other. The body and the world are essentially coupled, and the hand that acts, the mouth that speaks, and the feet that move have the capacity for organized intelligent behavior because they have learned from so-called objects. We accommodate ourselves to a world that simultaneously accommodates us. Further, it is not simply neutral objects that hands and mouths have learned from, but a historically shaped determinant set of objects, namely objects contextualized by this form of life with all of its technologies, material contexts, bodies, and sedimented ways of emoting, valuing, communicating, touching, thinking, and acting. We accommodate ourselves to and are accommodated by a world that has already taken shape due to a specific history of meaningful interpretive encroachments into it. As Russen writes, in general, growing up involves integrating oneself into a comfortable relationship with the parameters of one's surrounding world such that one can accomplish one's own projects by living from its terms." End quote. We certainly act to interpret the dimensions of our experience and organize them in such a way that they fit our actions and intentions. But the active, world of making, the active work of making the world a coherent place in which our existence and action make sense builds upon an already local determinate form of coherence. Phenomenology, to expose the fact of this local determinate form of coherence, and articulate its character, thus opens in philosophy what Russen, in human experience, identifies as a unique field of study, the field of our interpretive acts. And here's the Richter, the um, painting on a photograph. It's called 16.2.98. I imagine that that's the date that it was made. Um, so I'm not, I'm not pretending to give an uh, exhaustive or authoritative interpretation of Richter here. The thing that I notice is the, the way in which the paint from the painter, from the one who's observing the scene, makes itself manifest in the scene, right? Just thinking of the paint as these interpretive acts by which the scene is colored, so to speak. Um, and here in Kawashiro, Gray Mirror, which clearly Richter can't photograph without including him and his studio in it, so that's Richter, we see the same kind of thing. The work itself displays the observation of the ob observer, and uh, that's me <laughs> taking a photograph of it in Berlin with uh, Birkenau, which is another um, work by Richter, mirrored in the Kauerspiegel, uh, um, which I also recommend uh, looking into this work called Birkenau. In any case, we'll keep the official one there. Um, <clears throat> so you can't get the work without seeing the observer. Uh, it's, what I notice about these particular pieces. So philosophically speaking, what's the point here? How the world appears to us will reflect ourselves and our prejudices, how it has accommodated us in the past and the historical others who left us a meaningful interpreted world. What we experience is the character of an object reflects our relations, behavior, expectations, memories, and habituation. What comes to light in phenomenological study is therefore that our experience has a past and specific contexts of emergence that shape our present and our interpretations thereof. New moments of experience are integrated into already developed meaningful contexts. We do not simply receive data and then construct an interpretation of them as a naive empiricist view might have it. Rather, the specificities of our experience determine how things appear to us. Our experiential specificity is thus ambival ambivalent it empowers us to handle the world, and yet conceals elements or meanings that could have appeared. Experiential specificity is also an interpersonal matter. 
Experience is mediated by the specific characteristics and experiences of the other beings like us living around us. Since it is on the basis of their being in the world and their joining with us that we are inducted into a meaningful world. Whatever more universal concerns of justice or morality arise in human life, thus necessarily emerge within beings whose very capacity to engage meaningfully with the world takes a specific shape due to its production in and by essentially specific contexts, which is a point that, as Russen argues, Western conceptions of justice have typically failed to face. Mahmoud's parallel account of the tradition-bound character of human experience speaks directly to this critique of Western conceptions of justice and to whether it is possible to develop standards for transnational feminist praxis. Take a look here at these, and this is not something that I saw in Berlin, um, since they are in different countries. Take a look here at these different architectural accomplishments, each giving expression to a different kind of world. The Gothic Cathedral in Cologne, Germany. The Mies van der Rohe Seagram Building in New York. The Nasir al Malk Mosque in Shiraz, Iran. And the Temple of Concordia in Sicily. In Politics of Piety, Mahmoud argues that what has come to be called the West, and I'm just giving these to you so you can keep them in mind, thinking through what I'm um, in Politics of Piety, Mahmoud argues that what has been come, to, come to be called the West construes freedom as resistance, critique, and the subversion of or opposition to existing norms by an independent being taking a stand against the way things are. She writes, agency in this form of analysis is understood as the capacity to realize one's own interests against the weight of custom, tradition, transcendental will, or other obstacles, end quote. Her critical orientation to this construal is aimed ultimately at Western feminism. She seeks to denaturalize by showing the cultural character of the normative subject of liberal feminist theory. Such a construal fails to apprehend itself as expressive of a tradition. The construal of freedom as opposition, as a matter of realizing one's interests against the weight of the world, reflects an unrecognized commitment to a specific mode of life, one captured, one might say, with the secret building by the Seagram Building in New York. In other words, this is how insiders to this form of life express their belonging, their way of life. We conceive of freedom as opposition. Explicit resistance is implicitly obedience to a norm. It is the enactment of, and the pleasure produced by, the feeling of being at home in the world. And it is a way of inspiring welcome and affirmation from that world. Mahmoud's goal is to expose this conception of freedom as parochial and demonstrate that what quote unquote, we think of as universal values are in fact the one-sided products of this specific way of life. Beyond the logical point that subversion can be at its core accommodation, something of vital importance is lacking in the model of freedom as opposition that undermines the exercise of freedom in worlds that organize themselves around this priority. If our actions as free beings are enriched, supported, and filled out by the world around us, if we have the capacity to live, to have a meaningful life and engage in a meaningful world because of the existence of that world and of others, then to prevent access to that world is to undermine freedom and reduce its content. We can imagine why, given basic phenomenological insight, freedom would be relatively meaningless if it were simply a matter of our own self-definition. The content of agency depends on the resources the world around us offers to us such that to exercise freedom is precisely to be able to mobilize these resources. The normative subject of liberal feminist theory is not simply what would grow in human society if there were no obstructions to it, because it is through specific forms of determination, ambivalently obstructive and productive, that anything grows. Think again of these architectural forms. What rich cultural and religious resources lie implied in these structures? projected by them that lend themselves to us as avenues for meaningful existence. Mahmoud thus observes that we should, quote, think of agency not as a synonym for resistance to relations of domination, but as a capacity for action that historically specific relations of subordination enable and create, end quote. There is an essential subordination at the heart of agency 
a fundamental absence of consent, which brings us into being as beings who become capable of something like consent, even as this subordination is prior to the development of the being to be subordinated, for that subordination brings it into being. Accommodation by already existent terms is the route that the development of freedom takes. And some basic feeling of belonging to that determinate mode of being human is a significant part of our sense of ourselves as agents and our sense of basic fulfillment. Subordination and agency are pairs, co-essential, two coupled sides of the same process. As I grow through, in, and around the meanings that structure and organize my world, they become my meanings, and my grappling with and articulation of them is an experience, expression, and development of my agency. Let us look here at the example of Laila Abu Lugod's challenge to US policy in the war in Afghanistan. One of the factors invoked to motivate the war in Afghanistan was the Taliban's mistreatment of women. But while the US highlighted the unacceptable determinacy of the world from which one would be saving these women, it did not thematize the world to which it would be saving them. Abu Lagad's question concerns the violence that is entailed in this saving too. This is not clearly a world in which women would experience meaning, value, and freedom. In fact, the women she spoke with reflected with compassion on the isolation and loneliness they imagined women in the West would experience because they interpret the border between home and world to be rigidly structured. If what it is to be human is to be inside a way of life and to borrow from that way of life in one's own agency, it is not acceptable to simply offer the terms of one's way of life as a meaningful replacement for the way of life of other women. Mahmoud's study focuses on Muslim women in Egypt engaged in shared study and discussion of Islamic scriptures, social practices, and forms of bodily comportment. She observes them to be feeling out their sense of the value of being inside a particular world that makes sense to them, querying its still mysterious corners, exploring its dimensions and depths, and mixing with it their own capacity for sense-making so that it makes sense to them, so that it hangs together more or less coherently. They supplement the meaning artic and articulation this world gives their lives with their own activity of engagement, meeting it with their action and interpretation. Inside that world are specific avenues for making one's way, for becoming developed and cultivated. The meaningfulness of lives and actions depends on the existence of these avenues and these rich traditions. As Mahmoud writes, Quote, the agency I am exploring here does not belong to the women themselves, but is a product of the historically contingent diverse traditions in which they are located, end quote. They pursue these avenues since they have come to shape their own sense of what it means to live a meaningful life. Individual agency is a matter of being in a world and rising to meet it, grappling with the meanings it has already planted in one's experience and by which it has given that experience its fuel and shape. To make one's way is to do so in a world with determinate possibilities already operative, a rich and developed world that hangs together in a certain way, to which one is already habitually attached, and by which one is already motivated. Freedom is not simply a matter of resisting that world, of being an individual. The, resor the resources one has in an individual, as an individual, are meager compared to those of the shared world. Agency is a matter of coupling with the world, realizing its possibilities, and finding the world standing behind one's action, lending that action its weight and substance. Freedom does not exist separately from determinacy. It is always a matter of being with and mobilizing these objects, people, situations, and conditions. The different determinate worlds we inhabit cultivate different orientations and attitudes within us, as well as different desires. So there is no one way to be free. And it is not right to judge someone free simply on the basis of the fact that det the determinacies of their practices of freedom are the same as our own. If we are interested authentically in freedom, we must find out what it means for people to engage in action, find out how they navigate their existing world, and find satisfaction, a meeting of self and world in that world. To be clear, we have not abandoned the possibility of critically engaging with violent, oppressive, and exclusionary practices. This discussion is instead intended to establish the conditions for that kind of critical engagement. The critique must respect belonging to world in oneself and in others. Let us now theoretically pursue the possibility of critical engagement with practices of oppression, exploitation, and violence by turning to the idea of exposure to the beyond in what Russell calls the stance of quote unquote indifference. 
Though Mahmoud herself does not make this step, the phenomenological account of this experience emerges smoothly, I think, from the discussion up to this point. Section two. <coughs> Russin on the stance of indifference. The specific site of experience is, in Russin's terms, a site of exposure. The happening of experience, being in the world, is the unit here. The I and the world more or less in harmony of being at home. Russin argues that in this happening, however, we experience a deeper reality that exceeds the specificity we experience. As Husserl, for instance, has clearly shown, things, people, and the I appear in the form of having different sides that do not appear. The unit we described in the first section of the paper, the happening of experience in its I, other, and thing sides, is always also something that brings with it an outside or beyond. And with it, the possibility that the happening of experience could unfold differently. In experience, we are exposed to a reality that exceeds us. This is felt at the experiential level. Home, as Russell writes, is an edge that I experience as separating what is familiar from what is unfamiliar, such that what is familiar, unfamiliar is posited simultaneously and inseparably with the familiar. It is a function of this familiarity to project a domain of alienness. Insofar as it acclimatizes me to this way, these habits, and this world, it cultivates in me a non-familiarity with these other ways, habits, and worlds. The condition of the experience of familiarity is the existence of an outside, a beyond, an other. We can, of course, respond to the unfamiliar in any number of ways, and many respond by denying it. <clears throat> Yet our very practice of homemaking commits us to the idea that those unfamiliar others also engaged in homemaking are the same kind of beings as we are. They have made their worlds, their homes, for reasons that are similar to ours. And here, and this is not from Berlin, uh, but it's a Agnes Martin piece. Um, here we get, in, in some sense, a kind of representation of the stance of indifference, of indifferent universality. Um, space is separated into a grid. This is true. It is one can analyze space in terms of a grid. Each point is identical and like the others, even while it occupies a different position. Um, this clearly captures, as I said, one aspect of the nature of space, it, its indifferent quality. And it is what an artist has to respect in order to be expressive, the abstract character of space, um, the measurable character of space. Uh, and, you know, it's what we rely on in order to make our way in this specific world, the generic quality of space, the political recognition of people who, of, of ourselves as generic people who are welcome in it, no matter who we are, the a kind of image for a different universality. And what's interesting, of course, about Martin, and, and we're not going to, again, give an exhaustive interpretation of this particular work, is that she's putting on display, in some sense, the conditions of expression, right, and that this, this geometrical orientation towards space, but also in some sense um, using it to express something. So calling attention to the very form fact that the abstract wants to be expressed, right? Which means becoming determinate and becoming specific and kind of transgressing its own character as an abstract thing. Um, anyway, be that as it may, uh, I'm using this to represent the idea of in different universality. Our sense of justice thus rests in recognizing a certain universality to the human condition that should no more favor our way of living than it should favor that of others. Respecting culture and social reality and recognizing as unjust the exclusion of one culture by another. Um, in doing that, we are discerning a universal principle that affirms all of the things being equal, that people as such are to be supported in their homemaking. But this recognition of the value of people as such is also a recognition of a beyond of one's culture to which all cu cultures must implicitly be committed, or so I am arguing, by virtue of being a human culture. Any culture, this or that culture, in being itself is engaged in something significant and valuable and so no culture is privileged. 
Hence, our sense of justice compels us to endorse, as Russell argues, a universality of indifference. <clears throat> and this is simply projected by our embrace of the familiar, of a determinate way of life, the outside, as the other side of these practices of familiarity. This sense of justice as a stance of indifference or impartiality to whatever is determinate in human life, however, and I think this is the crux of, the, of this paper, so pay attention, <laughs> can only be expressed in determinate practices that themselves emerge and develop in religions, cultures, and history. The various channels that transformative human insight takes and by the form of which it is marked. To return to the Martin, um, artists express. In different universality is expressed. This core <coughs> insistence on the importance of recognizing the human in every human has taken political shape in various determinate historical practices. In the notion of universal human rights, for instance, um, which is declared by the UN, a determinate <coughs> political body, uh, that is more, that may be more, less fair than more, uh, in valuing the fair distribution of goods, procedural impartiality, and the ideal of democracy. It is also expressed, Russell argues, in various of the defining institutions of modernity, economically and capitalism, um, scientifically in the scientific revolution, and politically in liberal representative democracy. Three separate kinds of problems arise here. First, because the stance of indifference is an idea hatched historically in human culture that must itself be enacted in and as various specific political, social, and economic practices, it can never be purely indifferent. Second, the moral recognition of an indifferent human universality can play too forceful a hand regarding the other aspect of the human condition that I tried to explain at length in the previous section. It's tradition-bound and determinate character, and it can disavow and underestimate this character. Third, and relatedly, the institutionalized practices of recognizing indifference necessarily fail to uphold the indifference to which they are committed in principle. The operation of capitalism, for instance, empowers the already powerful, creating intense social division, motivating colonialism, preventing access to a free market rather than enabling it. Modern science produces an instrumental conception of truth that drives an invasive relationship with nature and normless technological development that undermines human habitation, habitation of the planet. And the political ideal of individual rights fails to protect the necessary, ex necessarily exclusionary needs of belonging and works against redressing injustice in historically established situations of inequality. Think about the, the claim to equality and how that undermines existing efforts to actually accomplish, you know, accomplish equality. All these practices and institutions can be criticized in the name of the very principle that inspired them, such that supporting the principle may require opposing the practices and institutions that, while they once ushered that principle into being, now betray and jeopardize it. The seeming contradictoriness facing the moral stance of indifference is that it can never simply be indifferent to determinacy, as it is explicitly invoked to protect people who are essentially determined and who need to belong somewhere. Thus, it must not suppress and disavow determinacy, which Russin's analyses show that we bring along even in our claim to the stance of indifference. As Hegel observes, Everything that forces its way into the objective and real world is subject to the principle of particularization." End quote. This is the crucial point that Russell's analyses make clear and that typical Western conceptions of justice fail to perceive adequately. The perspective of indifference, because it is a one-sided recognition of the human reality beyond culture, encourages a sense of moral self-righteousness in its self-identification as liberating when in fact, through its suppression of determinacy and difference, it becomes a force of oppression. <clears throat> Indeed, the key site for practicing this indifference, intercultural interaction, 
has been a site for destroying the relations that make up the heart of the human, as Fenwell writes, eroding human unity and installing fracture into community. And so here we see a fourth problem. Those whose Western liberal practices have most forcefully executed the stance of indifference, one might argue, have related to this beyond, this idea of humanity as such, as though they uniquely and unproblematically embody it, recognizing neither the limitations and biases of their own cultural determinacy, nor the fecundity and richness of different human practices. The momentum of influence and cultural interaction is thus allowed to go only one way. Further, it is as though paid for. The West provides its culture and practices of indifference and demands the vast material wealth of the colonized and the diversity of their expressions of freedom in return. Influence goes out, wealth comes in. In place of this self-satisfied and ultimately imperialist liberalism, we need, Russell argues, an ideal and a practice of multiculturalism understood itself as a determinate, unpredictable practice unfolding among determinate people. What is recognized in the insight that human beings are necessarily tradition bound is the fact that who others are shapes who we are. And this mutual influence reaches into the domain of indifference as well where we encounter those who live in other ways. Because we are different people, encounters with each other in the domain of indifference, in the domain of this beyond, are not encounters with indifferently generic, but with specific people. Consequently, an authentic embrace of the value of the beyond of human reality will always be an open interaction with determinacy in which we, whoever that we is, are as much ed educated and transformed by our encounter with them, whoever they are, as they are educated and transformed by their encounter with us. Third section, traditions and the stance of indifference. Cutter, finally, on sexist oppression. We have thus far sketched two basic principles that support Cutter's incisive critique of missionary feminism. The necessarily cultured, historical, tradition-bound character of human beings in terms of which they belong somewhere and their status as human as such. The first underlines Catter's point that our sociocultural forms will inevitably be determinate and that justice monism is a non-starter. Ideals are always expressed in and through determinacy. The second may indeed move us to judge negatively certain practices for transgressing the idea of the human as such. Still, and here I take myself to be defending one of Catter's central points, if we are committed simultaneously to the first, we must acknowledge that we cannot meaningfully engage, sorry, we cannot meaningfully judge any such practice prior to engagement with it and with those who live it and can reveal its meaning to us. Further, we cannot legitimately approach such practices while imagining them to be abstract and separate from other substantial elements of human life, such as the empowerment of operatives in belonging somewhere and thus cannot imagine that opposing a single practice is unilateral <coughs> good. Nonetheless, opposition to sexist oppression is grounded in a second principle. It is right and proper to oppose sexist oppression, though we cannot be sure we are seeing it when we think we are, because human beings are sites of exposure, irreducible to their determinacy, and demanding in principle that they be free of the constraints that would impose upon them only one determinate way of being free, or vision of freedom. Cutter herself requires some grounds for arguing, notwithstanding the significance of cultural determinacy, that sexist oppression is wrong and should be opposed. Her arguments for a non-ideal universal, universalism seem technically strategic, whereas I believe they can and should be grounded in a philosophical framing that would assert <coughs> there is a universality to be discovered here. She offers three strategic arguments. One, Quote, it is unclear how feminism can be a meaningful normative doctrine without universalist commitments, end quote. Two, cross-border feminist politics is needed because of geopolitical changes, particular, particularly those of, quote, cross-border formations of power brought about by an increasingly neoliberal global order, end quote. And three, since imperialism by definition is a border-crossing phenomenon, it is unclear, and this is a quote, that rejecting universalism can yield coherent anti-imperialist positions, end quote. These are legitimate insights, but on their own, I believe they are insufficient and rest on the unstated, 
presupposition that what is true emerges directly from what is needed. Such a link would need to be established here, or one would need to argue that independently of what we may or may not want from the point of view of a concern for justice, we do in fact share in something universal. I take the latter approach here, that we share in something universal. The normative grounding for the argument against sexist oppression lies in the actual beyondness or the humanity of women, which must not be denied and subordinated to others, and which reveals itself within experience as one of its constitutive structures. Further, it is not that any given woman must assert this humanity and actively choose her activities, and that she must understand that she should choose, she could choose otherwise in the mode of the reflexive role distance that Cotter rightly criticizes. To require, require such would be to transgress the determinant and its influence and power in herself and the other as well as to disavow the absence of distance we have from our own ways of life. However, it is incumbent upon any culture, as I have argued, to be committed in some sense to the stance of indifference. That is, to recognize the contingency of its specific way of realizing the essential needs of humanity, both in relation to itself as a culture and in relation to its members. The world in which any given woman lives should hold itself to and answer for her capacity to appear and exist differently. And thus it should not allow her subordination to specific others. But this general claim is always accompanied and held in check, and I hear, here I take myself to be expressing Cotter's arguments, by two significant considerations grounded, I believe, in phenomenological insight into the determinacy of forms of life. First, a person may still well live in ways that she takes to be commanded by external traditional dictates. For there may be a sense of fulfillment here that is important to her in such a way that to live in terms of these commands is an expression of her enactment of her own life. And thus the very avenue through which she experiences and can discern her own agency. After all, freedom and fulfillment are bolstered and conditioned by the worlds to which we belong. So our attachment to these worlds is never purely one of subordination. Second, one could never actually, or in practice, legitimately honor one's status as beyond determination, as though it were possible to avoid determination. We can take as an example Cotter's approach to what she calls household headship complementarianism, which, as a gender complementarian view, believes that men and women should occupy different social roles. In particular, it associates the feminine role with specialization in household labor and dependency on and deference to men, and associates the masculine role with preferential <coughs> direct access to goods that are necessary to survival. While Cather does not oppose all gender complementarian worldviews, she asserts that headship complementarianism is incompatible with feminist ideals because it builds, quote, asymmetrical vulnerability into the roles. Yet, she simultaneously argues that working through and with this complementarianism to enhance women's situations may be the proper feminist thing to do in any given situation. Put in terms of my argument here, the duality of these foundational principles will often require that they find a way to compromise with each other. Cotter seeks to establish a non-ideal universalism, claiming that opposition to sexism, <coughs> quote, underdetermines how gender justice should be brought about in particular cases." End quote. My desire here is essentially to support that work through the infrastructure that I believe is provided by two points. One, a phenomenological analysis of the determinacy of experience offers normative justification for this underdetermination and a philosophical argument <coughs> for the political weight of determinacy. And two, Phenomenological analysis of the stance of indifference offers normative justification for opposition to sexist oppression. These two points dovetail in the fact that any expression and recognition of our status as beyond must travel through the gauntlet of determination. The discerning agent must find out how to render opposition to sexist oppression inside the situation. And that is the point that Cutter is trying to get across in this idea that universalism is non-ideal. Just as there is an inevitable determinacy to our existence and to the place we make a home, so also 
action in the name of our character as beyond home will be determined. Russell invokes the example of art to bring this full circle, to illuminate the two-sided character of determinacy. The artwork is not simply its finite material, but brings meaning to manifestation that outstrips the determinacy of its expression. This is similar to the character of cultural practices. Through them, we express our commitments and character, but this expression and these commitments will always outstrip the determinacy of their expression. Nevertheless, they rely on determinacy in order to appear at all. Those who have historically been heavy handed with the stance of indifference have degraded this two sidedness in the practices of others. And here to put my own cultural determinacy on display as a person who has inherited the Western Christian tradition is a Botticelli, another work that I saw in Berlin. Um, a Christian scene with an angel writing. Right there. In ways that have the capacity to communicate beyond the specificity of culture. The translatability of language is something that's being, I think, shown here. Jesus in community with the spectator by looking out at whomever, but also reaching for food in the form of breast milk body. The lilies is flowers and also pen, the various connections that lie here between determinacy and indeterminacy, or specificity and other, or openness. Not that that's what Botticelli was, thought he was doing. I don't know what he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> Given the necessary determinacy of action and of the places we make home, solutions to problems must suit their situations. The expression of values will always have to unfold inside of determinate cultural situations. There is no abstract solution. As Cotter argues, following Amartya Sen, this is why justice is always a matter of justice enhancement and not justice accomplishment. For it to be justice as such would be to claim a generality that disavows determinacy. To conclude, Amya Srinivasan nicely captures the tradition-bound character of our thinking and the uncertainty that the necessary determinacy of situation and action inspires. She writes, feminism is not a philosophy or a theory or even a point of view. It is a political movement to transform the world beyond recognition. It asks, what would it be to end the political, social, sexual, economic, psychological, and physical subordination of women? It answers, we do not know. Let us try and see, end quote. This we do not know could be feminism's strength if it would finally acknowledge the determinacy that surrounds it and that fills the world with a richness that will never, to our delight, be comprehended. Yeah.